in helping us with this bill and with this concept. And today we um, really want to hear from, on this hearing process, from um, a gentleman that um, has been instrumental in this process and is certainly an expert in, the, in this field. His name is Mr. Cass Brewer. He's an assistant professor at Georgia State University Law School. He's a counsel at the firm of Morris, Manning, and Martin in the tax-exempt <coughs> tax organization and wealth planning practices. He co-chaired co the um, Georgia State Bar nonprofit law sector and past chair of the Partnership and LLC Committee. Cass has been uh, recognized and contributed to legal in the legal community around this state. He's been a frequent speaker and, uh, and recognized um, and an author and recognized as an expert in a low-profit, limited liability corporate structure. And having said that, from my background, I'm certainly an, uh, an expert in low profit in any of the businesses I've ever been involved <laughs> in. So uh, I thought we're always <laughs> intended, but that's maybe the way it worked out. Huh? But uh, Mr. Chairman, I would certainly appreciate you hearing us today sure. and members and, and would introduce Cass and have him to address All this right. committee and answer any questions we may have on this. I think Mr. Burr would be good to lead out with you and let you tell us the thing I was uh, mentioning to Representative Burns earlier today. I think the interests uh, of the committee and the issue is where within our current statutes <clears throat> are we failing to have a corporate type entity or some legal entity that is to fill a need that you're saying is not there and how this will address that particular problem. Okay. All right. Um, well, again, thank you for having me here today. Yes, sir. Um, the Low Profit Limited Liability Company, or L3C, from low profit limited liability company is to sum it up is designed to facilitate the flow of capital investment capital from private foundations um, the way it does that is through a particular type of investment that private foundations make called a program related investment many of you may be f familiar with the fact that private foundations have to distribute up to five percent or five percent or more of their assets every year and they normally do that by way of grants but there's another way they can do it which is make investments that are aligned with their charitable mission and those are called program related investments what the L3C statute does is it takes those requirements which are federal law under the the regulations uh, internal revenue code regulations and dovetails those that federal law with state law so that it provides, if you will, um, a, a baked-in set of rules for PRIs. It's, it's been described as it um, L3Cs have in their DNA these program-related investment rules. So that would be the uh, – now, currently, uh, you can make PRIs in LLCs and limited partnerships and corporations – so that there is nothing uh, preventing, Georgia law certainly does not prevent PRIs from happening currently, but this would be designed to facilitate it, encourage it, and it will still be necessary for the advisors to any private foundation to do their homework, do their due diligence, make sure that the entity is complying with federal law, but it will have this baked in set of rules under the, the Georgia code that they can turn to for for comfort that the entity is fulfilling the requirements for a PRI. I think I, perhaps I should just stop there and then we can go in as much detail, further detail as you like. Well, I'm, I may be showing a lot of my depth of ignorance, but uh, when we talk about program-related investment, that's your PRI term, mm -hmm. uh, and, and give me a better definition of what that is, please. Okay. Try to give you an example. Let's suppose that a business is uh, in need of capital to refurbish its plant, okay. um, potentially uh, to solve some environmental problem. Okay. That capital that's required simply to bring a structure or bring a business up to standard, so to speak, is very risky capital, usually. Um, most investors want to invest in a plant or a piece of property or whatever it may be that's already up to standard and then the profit potential is going to be from further development done on the property. Well, one way that private foundations have encouraged uh, refurbishment, development, innovation is to make grants to businesses. 
but they're also entitled to Pri make these private foundations, private and, foundations, and charitable yes. contributions, distributions to, to for a business to for-profit businesses. Yes, sir. They sure can. Mm -hmm. um, they have to do their homework. They have to make sure that the money is used for the proper purposes, and uh, but they are entitled to make mm -hmm. make these grants. They can also do it through this program related investment. So let's suppose the manufacturing plan I was talking about needed $5 million to, clean bring, up money. to clean up money. And, and <coughs> that money could not be raised from the banks. It couldn't be raised from private investment. It couldn't be raised even from the owners of the business. But a foundation that's interested in, let's say, um, urban uh, development, mm -hmm. um, jobs, education, uh, training, whatever, could invest $5 million of that very risky capital into an L3C or an LLC and allow that money to essentially earn no return whatsoever. Okay? No, it, it would be equivalent to a no interest rate loan. Other money could then be invested and receive a normal market rate of return to complete the, the rehabilitation of the business. If the venture ultimately is successful, the private foundation could get its $5 million back, which it could then turn around and reuse in other charitable endeavors. That can appeal to a private foundation because if, if it's successful, if the, if the plant or the cleanup or whatever is successful, they do get their money back. If they don't, if it's not successful, it fails, then they're no worse off than they would have been with a grant, with outright giving away the money. Mm -hmm. And so, um, more and more private <coughs> foundations these days are beginning, uh, are, are doing PRIs. Uh, the Gates Foundation has done a number of them. The Kaufman Foundation does a number of them. Uh, we haven't seen many in Georgia, but a lot of other foundations across the country are engaging in PRIs. D does that help? Some. It does somewhat. And I'll carry that a step further, if, if you don't mind, and that is to now tell me where we are having to fill in a gap again that is not available in Georgia under our current structure of uh, legal entities. Okay. Well, the I wouldn't. There is no gap. I guess I would say. Uh, in other words, existing Georgia law can accommodate. PRIs. I, I could create today an LLC that receives a PRI from a private foundation mm -hmm. and engages in the same cleanup process mm -hmm. that we talked about. The advantage of the L3C is, uh, it, it, in, to my mind, twofold. One, again, it brings into our code, into the Limited Liability Company Act, those requirements for a PRI. Otherwise, in my LLC, I, I have to draft them into the operating agreement or draft them into the articles of organization. That's not a big job. That's not hard to do. You can do that. But with the L3C, I don't have to. Mm. It's already there. Um, it also gives us a way to identify these organizations that are engaging in this type of investment, these PRIs. And I think that's helpful both to the public to have some designation as to what these entities are about in their name itself. And it also can be helpful for the regulators when they're looking to see, is this organization really doing as it says it's going to do? Um, because if it's, if it's designated without L3C, you know that it should be complying with these restrictions under Georgia law. All right. That's very good. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Questions of uh, the presenters? <clears throat> from anyone on the committee. And we do have over here to your my left, Allie. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is, is um, do you have any, is it on? I'm sorry, I thought it was. It's okay. I think Push, I can I apologize. talk loud enough. Um, do you have any data as how successful these um, L3Cs have been in the past in the states where they have been put into effect? Uh, no, no hard data, no. Um, what we know is that nine states have passed L3C legislation, uh, North Carolina being 
closest one to us. The others are Illinois, Michigan, Vermont. Um, uh, forgive me one moment. Illinois, Louisiana, Maine, Michigan, North Carolina, Rhode Island, Utah, Ver Vermont, and Wyoming. Um, from, again, I wouldn't call this hard data, I would call it internet research. <laughs> we have uh, learned that there are about 600 of these entities that have been formed thus far across the United States. Um, there, there have been some uh, notable ex success stories. There was an organization called Moo Milk, and it's M-O-O -O, Milk for Maine's own organic milk. And that was an organization created in L3C that was created to allow uh, a group of farmers, dairy farmers, to pool their resources and bring organic milk to the market in Maine. Um, they had been shut out of competition by one of the large uh, distributors there, milk distributors who felt like organic milk was not going to be marketable and profitable. Um, there are other examples as well. Um, uh, there's an um, um, organization out of Michigan that's allowing uh, actually prisoners at um, one of the um, facilities there to uh, uh, make um, uh, meals, food, uh, for uh, individuals. And the L3C then sells the food. So I, those are the two that leap to mind. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I don't have hard data on, you know, economic impact, um, but we do know there have been some successful L3Cs. Ms. Dobbs. A mass Can follow you? up. Do you have in <coughs> mind particular businesses or entities in Georgia now that would be interested in using this L3C type of um, business? Um, yes, we actually already have one example. Uh, it's a company called Cedar L3C. And I don't profess to fully understand exactly what they do. It's very, it's, it's very innovative and uh, technical. But uh, the bottom line is they create uh, containers that allow uh, temperature sensitive drugs to be transported over great distances without any power to generate um, uh, you know, refrigeration. And uh, that's important for blood. It's important for um, drugs. It's, it's, it has military application. It also has humanitarian application. And uh, they're based right here in Atlanta. They actually formed, as I recall, under Michigan's law, mm -hmm. under Michigan's law. And they were funded in part by the Gates Foundation. <laughs> but you see, they have that mixed uh, commercial as well as charitable or humanitarian component with these uh, containers that can transport the temperature sensitive materials over great distances. Thank you. You want to follow up with that, Mr. Burns? I wouldn't, Mr. Chairman. Representative Dobbs, um, Mike Moreland was here for the subcommittee meeting. He's actually one of the founders of the Cedar Group and um, they're working with the CDC is one of their primary contacts and Mike is actually could not be here today because he's on, he's on the way back to Africa as far as part of the um, the, the proving of the of the product and um, mm -hmm. and um, if if we need some more information provided for in that area, Will Hurst also know, is very familiar with the company as well as I am myself. We could provide that for you if we. But they were a very uh, very good group of young folks that had a good product. Very good, Mr. Wells. Did you have yours on? Yes. Sir. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. A couple of questions on um, with respect to the tax obligations. What 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 are we? What would be the implications for the tax base uh, to the state if we're allowing this company to form, and what would be their obligations statewide and federally um, on the profits that they do make? Okay. Um, the the L3C is a variant, really, of an LLC, which of course we already have and have had for a number of years. LLCs, from an income tax standpoint are uh, flow-throughs. So if uh, I'm a member of an LLC, the LLC itself does not pay federal tax, it does not pay state income tax, but rather the revenues show up on my individual return and I pay taxes on that. The L3C would be exactly the same way. Now, 
of course, private foundation investors in the L3C, just as they would in the LLC, would not pay income tax. Um, but that's because they're tax exempt, not because of any special attribute of the L3C. In terms of property tax, sales tax, etc., uh, there are no special provisions. It would be taxed in the same manner as an LLC. The, the, I didn't see in the, in the language in the bill that there's a requirement that the investors be nonprofits, and, and that would not be required. Correct. So it could be uh, a for-profit investor mm -hmm. or a nonprofit investor. Well, it, it would require at least one investor that has a charitable mission. One or more of the interests in the L3C would have to be charitable okay. in nature. If you have no charitable investments, no charitable entities, then it wouldn't properly qualify as an L3C. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, ma'am. Follow Please up. Please follow up. Could, could you direct me to that language in the, in the bill then? Yes. Look at um, line on the first page. Uh, I assume you have the same. This is LC number 25 at the top right hand corner. 5887. Yes, sir. Um, look at line 20. B, subparagraph B. Yes, sir. No significant purpose of one or more limited liability company interests in the limited liability company shall be the production of income or the appreciation of property. That's the magic language that comes from the federal regulations that, that describes a charitable purpose. You can also look in line 17, um, which talks about the limited liability company itself, and it states the limited liability company significantly furthers the accomplishment or one or more purposes within in the meaning of that section 170 of the Internal Revenue Code, which is the charitable contribution section. Mr. Chairman, another Please. follow up? Yes, sir. Um, and what would be... Uh, this is two questions, really. When we're talking about significant income on line 23, significant income and capital appreciation, um, how are we defining that? I mean, it, you know, and then, and then the second part of that is, is to what purpose would the income, if it is significant or if it's not significant, whatever that income is, to what purpose would the LLC be able to apply that, that revenue towards? Okay. Um, I guess I will take the second question first. The revenue from the LLC can be used in any way um, that a normal LLC can use that revenue. It can reinvest it. It can distribute it out to its members, um, you know, capital expenditures, operating expenditures, no difference between an L3C and an LLC in that regard. Mm -hmm. And then, now remind me the first part of your question again. I'm sorry. Um, Purposes, but um, it, what are we when we're defining significant income ah. or capital appreciation? Appreciation. That seems to be a standard that we're we're creating for this company to distinguish it from something else. Yes. And if we don't, if we don't create that distinction, then I think we need to be more specific as to what we're talking about when we say significant. Is that five percent? Is that of the overall investment? Is it twenty-five percent? What is that? This goes, th this language, it, first of all, it's taken from the regulations, from the federal regulations that deal with program-related investments. One of the requirements for a program, for a proper program-related investment is that the private foundation not have a profit motive as its central purpose for making that investment. If the private foundation has a profit motive, as its central purpose of making the investment, then it really should be part of their endowment assets. It's not the proper subject of a PRI. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this language is intended to say that when, you're an, when you, private foundation, are deciding whether or not to make your investment, you need to view this as tantamount to a grant, but with the prospect, the possibility of being repaid and possibly even making money, although it's admittedly a long shot. Is that 
I mean, it is a facts and circumstances test. There is no, it's not 5% chance of making money or 20% chance. It's a, what is my motive for making this investment? That's what it's intended to get out. And there's no further guidance from the, from the IRS on that. Is that, does that help, helpful? Further questions we have over here, Mr. Maddox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this kind of follows up on Representative Welch. I was just reading that section. Doesn't it really say, though it shall not be, no significant purpose of one or more of the interest shall be production of income or appreciation of property. However, the fact that the liability company produces a significant income or capital appreciation shall not be conclusive evidence of a significant purpose involving production of income. Yeah. Don't you love the Internal Revenue Code? Mm -hmm. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, go ahead, your question. I mean, I think I know where you're going. Well, I, that, that language is just a little bit confusing yeah. to me, especially after the discussion you yeah, have represented well. Yeah. It's, it, it is very confusing, no question. Um, and again, it is straight from the Treasury regulations under the Internal Re Revenue Code. The um, and there, there are examples in the regulations that flesh out sort of what this means. Um, and it, uh, in, in particular with uh, equity type investments, which this would be. So if we go, go back to our example of the manufacturing plant that needed cleanup. And let's say at the time we were underwriting that investment and doing our projections, it, it appeared that this $5 million in capital invested by this private foundation would never be recovered, okay? That it's, it's a, a very risky investment. It's to bring the infrastructure back up to standard. And so the prospect of it ever being repaid is very, very low. However, turns out that this manufacturing plant becomes the star producer Okay, and, is, and becomes the most profitable plant in its industry. Therefore, it not only repays the five million, <coughs> but then let's say it doubles it and the private foundation gets back $10 million. <coughs> that would all be governed by the terms of the operating agreement in the <coughs> L3C. Well, the I if, with, with hindsight, the IRI IRS might come back in and say, aha, you didn't make a valid PRI because you made $10 million. See, it was profitable. So you couldn't have had a charitable purpose when you first made this. <coughs> but point of fact is when the investment <coughs> was made years earlier, it did not have a significant purpose of the production of income or appreciation of property. Does that help at all? In other words, it's, it's designed to, to allow you to make money without that being used as an argument that you shouldn't have made the PRI to begin with because it's supposed to be like charity. <coughs> Does if that I make sense at <coughs> all? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. I was a follow up. If I <coughs> glean something out of this, the foundation, which is a, quote, charitable foundation, is not desiring to use what is its capital investments to fund this particular program, but it's willing to say we'll take some of our regular earnings annually <coughs> and fund, like it, as you say, a grant for this purpose, hoping it does something good in the community. And assuming it turns out good and there is a return of profit back to them of their five million, to use your example, plus another five million, would they then be required to say, okay, the five million we received we got we have got to now turn around and, and grant it back out or do they turn it into their investment portfolio? I guess the <coughs> after step, what happens with that money? Okay. Once they receive the five million original capital investment back plus the five million in profit, they are required to redeploy that money. Okay. E either as another program related investment okay. or they could just use it to make grants. Okay. So it it stays in non profit. Yes, it does. <coughs> yes, Can't it come does. back in their portfolio. In other words, saying, "Okay, we've we've received back five plus another five. We've got ten million. We're going to put that back into our investment portfolio." Right. As okay. long as it remains a program-related investment. Right. Now, if the if the structure of the company itself changes, so the L three C becomes so profitable that it becomes, let's say, a public company. Okay. 
then the private foundation could, after taking the earnings off of that, uh, have that stock in that public company become part of its endowment. Okay. okay. <coughs> Thank you. Anything further from committee members? Well, we appreciate your time today to be with us and explain this. I think you've listed some of the clouds off of it, <laughs> make it a little more understandable. Uh, to say this is a hearing today, mostly just to get the information, and then we're going to probably, at our next meeting, take up the bill for a vote. But I want to ask if there's anyone else in the audience who would like to address the uh, committee on House Bill 594. Seems to have covered it all. Appreciate you being with us, Mr. Help Brewer. Again. Thank you. Just let me know. Thank you, Mr. Help. Chairman and committee yes, members. We appreciate your attention. Thank you, too, for bringing this, Mr. Burns. Next we will have is the uh, House Bill 763, which is Representative Atwood's bill on juries, and the compilation of juries. If you'd like to come around, Mr. Atwood, and if you have a chance, we're happy to see you. <coughs> Got a lot of 7-Elevens in here. Is it okay? I don't see the other one. One seventy nine. Here. Okay, give me one. Where's Grant? Won't kill him. Representative Atwood, yeah. pleased to see you here today with us, and will you fill us in? Regarding your House Bill 763. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I'm uh, glad to be with you today. This literally is a little housekeeping bill. As you may recall, <laughs> House Bill 415, which was rather voluminous, passed late in the session last year. And this bill is meant to better clarify a couple of small sections of that original bill. Essentially what it does is any person who has been convicted of a felony in either state or federal court uh, who has not had his or her rights restored, and any person who has been judicially determined to be mentally incompetent shall not be eligible to serve as either a trial juror or a grand juror. And it also does one other thing at the request of the, of the clerks, any jurors that were summoned prior to July 1st, 2012, we can still, uh, those lists will still remain eligible uh, to require the veneer. So that is essentially what it does, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. What was the bill number last year that we worked 415. out of? 415. 415. Yes, sir. And 415, as the committee will remember, was a full rewrite of the procedure by which and the process by which we uh, select jurors who have a centralized bank at the uh, state level, which would be used for compiling a pool of jurors and then the local clerks would draw out of that pool and just really inadvertently we left out what was a existing language which is the language you see identified as 15 12 40 beginning on line 10 and so what we're now doing is reinserting the same exact language that existed under the prior code I for that we, reason i think that's, that's absolutely correct uh, okay. mr chairman i think we were uh, fairly protected with common law, but this is just to be in an right. abundance of caution to do yep. that. So. And I think it was any, anyone's intent to allow the convicted felons to now be sitting on jurors. I appreciate that. Any questions of uh, <clears throat> Representative Atwood from committee members? If not, we'll thank you for your comments, and I'm gonna, I have several people who'd like to address the uh, committee. We have Stephanie Woodward. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong bill. I'm sorry, wrong bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got off, the got off to another seven. Yeah, we got a number of bills. I apologize. Back on 763. Anyone here who wishes to speak on HB 763? Mr. Carrie, I'll see you peeking around there. <laughs> I'd just like to let the committee know that uh, this bill uh, was endorsed by the Judicial Council of Georgia and in support of it. Very good. I appreciate your attention to it. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. We have nothing further, then I'll close off further public comments, and the bill is now on the breast of the committee. Uh, do we have a motion? Move, move is due pass. Is there a second to the motion? Second. It has been seconded. Do we have any further discussion regarding the motion? Do we have any amendments? 
There being no further amendments, uh, Chair will call the question. Motion is due pass on HB 763 as presented, LC 295080S. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. The motion carries. <coughs> Thank you, too, Representative Atwood, for your diligence in getting that to us in a timely manner. We now will have a hearing on HB 711, and uh, the bill is presented by uh, Representative Lindsay, our majority whip. And uh, Ms. Lindsay, you can come around if you'd like, if you want to. Jimmy, Have I you want to sit with you? I You're would, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Sinefit to come join me. All right. Ms. Sinefit, where are you? Oh, there you are. There she Sorry. <laughs> we still call her Ms. Sinefit, but I think she's changed her last name. No, I you didn't. That's right. You I kept, decided to make it easy on you. You kept it. Okay, my mistake. She have is you, now. Have you made it easy on the guy that's <laughs> married? <laughs> I'll leave that to him too. <laughs> we'll let you pull your mic around. I think you're going to start out, Ms. Lindsay, yes, but uh, would, introduce, if you would, the person sitting with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have the honor of having with me today uh, Chuck Spejos, who's the solicitor uh, of Henry County, and Ms. Centerfit, who uh, is here down at the General Assembly, a well known figure representing various um, shelters and uh, and other groups uh, interested in the issue of family violence. Thank you. Glad to have you here. I have, um, over the last two years, I believe, I've had the great honor to serve on the Georgia Family Violence Commission with both Mr. Uh, Spejos and Ms. Centerfit. And uh, one thing very great about, I found about the Georgia Family Violence Commission, it is a great place for folks to come uh, who are concerned about the same issue but come from very different perspectives. In particular, we often have situations where prosecutors and uh, advocates for victims of family violence are uh, having a very different perspective on things. And we found that the Georgia Family Violence Commission has been a great place to come and sit and find common ground. And that's what HB 711 uh, does. Uh, and it is a bill that uh, we worked very hard on with, within the Georgia Family Violence Commission. Uh, this committee may be aware that in addition to myself, uh, Penny Houston, and uh, Stephen Allison also served uh, as House representatives on that committee, commission rather. Uh, this bill has been worked on for, for quite frankly several years. Let me sort of broadly tell you what is what we have in the bill. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I uh, ask you to please focus on LC 295089S. Uh, LC 295070S is the bill as passed out of the subcommittee, and uh, I will point out the places where it's slightly different. So you're, one you're all for a substitute. I do. Uh, most of uh, 89S is a cleanup uh, that was worked on by our ever-efficient uh, legislative counsel, uh, Jill Travis. Uh, but uh, there is one substantive uh, change I do have from uh, the subcommittee that I will sort of address when I get to it. Uh, section 1 of the bill, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, deals with the uh, with the uh, spousal privilege and when uh, there is an exception uh, to the spousal privilege uh, that can compel uh, one spouse to testify against another. Uh, right already under Georgia law, we have recognized an exception where uh, a minor child is involved and one of the spouses has committed the family violence against that, that child and, but, and the other spouse can be compelled to testify. What this bill does is expand that uh, to also include uh, the issue of uh, the violence against uh, the one spouse <coughs> against another uh, in two different ways, either direct physical violence uh, against uh, the, the spouse or damage to that spouse's property. Um, the, the example that I'll give is, you know, obviously a beating would be the direct physical violence, uh, taking uh, clothes out of a closet, hauling them onto the front steps of the house, pouring lighter fluid on it and burning it would be the example of the other. Uh, in case you want to know, uh, that's exactly a case I had back when I was a young lawyer, uh, when I had a victim, when I was representing a victim who faced that sort of situation. It's good the clothes are not on the body at the time. Yeah, fortunately, fortunately wasn't, but unfortunately she was beat up rather badly in other ways. Uh, it is also right here that I do have a, a change from 70S, a substantive change. Uh, there was in the original bill an additional exception uh, recognized if the husband and wife 
were alleged to have acted jointly in the commission of a crime charge. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I believe that that is something that's that may be necessary uh, in another context, but uh, I wanted to try to keep this bill narrowly focused on the issue of family violence. And so we, we did, uh, at the request of, uh, of some of our friends, uh, pull that aspect out so we could keep this bill narrowly uh, tailored to deal with the issue of family violence. If I could ask uh, Mr. Spejos to sort of talk <coughs> for a moment about the importance of this section when it comes to prosecuting family violence. Please do. Let's pull that around. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity <coughs> to address the committee today. Um, a brief history of the way domestic violence has been handled in the state of Georgia over, say, the last 22 or 23 years that I can speak to. <coughs> years ago, we started out with the premise that it was purely a victim's decision about whether or not we would prosecute domestic violence cases. Um, I was a police officer in the early 90s when that was the approach. You could actually go to a scene of a domestic violence case. You could see physical evidence of abuse that had taken place. You could have statements that something took, transpired. And if the victim was adamant that it didn't happen or I don't want anything done about it, the standard practice was to get in your patrol car and go home or go back to work. Um, there was a recognition during that period of time throughout this country and in Georgia that, that that was not a good practice, and that's one of the reasons our numbers were so high about domestic violence and deaths that resulted from domestic violence cases. Into the 90s and early into 2000, we saw a transition in prosecution with the concept of domestic violence is not only a crime against a victim, but it's also a crime against the state of Georgia and that it needs to be prosecuted and that we have professional prosecutors that are tasked with making the decisions about how to proceed with these cases. Of course, the victim's input is a factor that goes in pl into play in that, but the victim themselves shouldn't be driving that. We saw where we improved our numbers in Georgia and made some real progress towards ending domestic violence. Then in 2005, we got dealt a pretty big blow in the Crawford v. Washington case by the U.S. Supreme Court where we were now forced to no longer have the ability to use statements given to a police officer immediately after a case took place or an incident took place when a witness wasn't available. In the past, before Crawford came out, one of three things took place when a victim of domestic violence was called to testify. One was she came, and I'm going to use she because majority of the times it's a she, she came and she willingly testified. Um, that that is, I'm not going to say that's rare, but that wasn't always the case. The other two times would be either they would come, they would feel the need to testify, but to minimize or try to reduce or otherwise negate previous statements because, again, they're living in a very controlled environment, oftentimes still with the batterer. Or, prior to Crawford, they would invoke this privilege, and what we would do is the state of Georgia would call the police officer that had been there, that had taken the evidence from them, the statement from them immediately following the incident, which was most likely the closest we were ever going to get to the truth of what really happened, and we would try the case that way. It was still a challenge, but we successfully prosecuted a lot of those cases. And we also saw a lot of those cases closed with a disposition that included treatment for the offender, treatment for the family, that there was some true intervention and some subsequent supervision and some recognition that that behavior was not accepted in this community. Once this Crawford case came out, it accented how bad, out of date Georgia was. Georgia is one of six states left in this country that still has this privilege. Um, this, this statute is being amended to allow any evidence that would be admissible in a criminal prosecution when the victim is the spouse. Uh, there's been some discussion about narrowing that and, there, and, and what have you, but I submit that the current rules of evidence handle what should or shouldn't come in in a given case. The policy issue here is whether or not Georgia wants to still recognize a privilege, quite frankly, to abuse your spouse and then control her or not to con testify against you. So that's the history of it, and that's kind of where we're at, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. It is the common law, I believe, <coughs> principle on the relationship between spouses about not being able to compel. Yeah. So what we're saying is we've carried over since the beginning of time that principle as part of our common law heritage. And and the fact of the matter is, as it's <coughs> played out, Mr. Chairman, as 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 those of us who've been involved in this issue know, very rarely uh, do we have a situation where there's family violence only once. Mm -hmm. It's uh, usually a recurring incident, and uh, if a uh, 
if an abuser uh, in, in a relationship uh, can convince the spouse once, the victim's spouse once, uh, not to testify, that only emboldens that individual in the future and will likely to lead to an escalation of violence in the home uh, rather than a reduction in it. I want to also emphasize that uh, in our present day world, uh, many relationships do not involve uh, marriage. And the great irony here is that underneath Georgia's existing law, someone who is not in a marital relationship uh, has uh, greater protections uh, in yeah. terms of uh, making sure that the wrongdoer goes to court than we do with someone who is in a marital relationship, mm -hmm. given the, the existing law. That's sort of it regarding Section 1 of the bill. Section 2 of the bill is a bill, is a part that the uh, Victims' Rights Groups have thought was very important and, and I also think is important in terms of providing a limited conditional privilege uh, for, uh, for um, agents of, uh, of these um, shelters. For when the person comes in and is seeking help, uh, there is, uh, we, we are recognizing that there is a presumption of privacy uh, and a privilege there uh, that in regard to the communication, uh, which will involve not only statements about uh, what the person may have done to them, what, what the perpetrator may have done to them, but a myriad of other things, uh, you know, including their children, including where they're going to go to to try to find safety, what they, uh, what their uh, family plan is after the state of a myriad of other things uh, that we simply want to to limit uh, the the ability uh, to to get a hold of that kind of private information. We do have in place a system a set up uh, for the judge to review that <coughs> uh, to determine whether or not some part of what the uh, agent has in terms of their file uh, should be turned over to uh, either law enforcement or the perpetrator. Um, we have a weighing test that takes place, um, you know, in terms of whether or not it's material, whether or not it's simply sought for the purpose of character impeachment, uh, whether or not it's sought to uh, to um, to somehow embarrass the victim, or most importantly, whether or not there's a weighing test that takes place, whether or not the negative effect of the disclosure of the evidence is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice uh, using a well-recognized uh, weighing test. Uh, that's uh, that's used in other aspects of uh, of criminal and civil law uh, when a privilege is involved. Um, I believe how many other states? Thirty eight. Thirty nine states 30, in the District of Columbia. Thirty nine states in the District of Columbia uh, have uh, similar kinds of uh, limited conditional privileges in place. Uh, it's a it's something that has worked very well. Uh, what we're trying to do is encourage folks to come to these shelters when they uh, have been victimized. Uh, and give them a sense of security uh, about what they may be saying to, to the people when they first have their original intake. Uh, this is, in my mind, just as important as the uh, spousal privilege issue uh, when it comes to uh, the situation. We're trying to, to make it easier to prosecute these matters, and we're also trying to make it easier uh, for the victims to come and seek uh, uh, shelter and security in those first uh, very dangerous hours after they've become a victim of domestic abuse. And if I could ask Ms. Centerfit to sort of expand. Uh, Please on do. The policy Thank aspects. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, we are grateful for Representative Lindsay's leadership in bringing this bill because this has been a priority for the domestic violence shelters around the state for several years to obtain this kind of protection that we believe is so necessary in order to encourage victims to seek help and hopefully get safe. Um, Georgia, unfortunately, is in the minority of jurisdictions in terms of not currently providing this kind of protection, and it's actually been recommended by the U.S. Department of Justice under both the Reagan and Clinton administrations that states adopt just this kind of confidentiality protection for victims of domestic violence. The reason we think that these communications between a victim and an advocate should be protected is because victims come into a shelter in a state of crisis. They may have left in the middle of the night. Um, they may have children in tow. And they're not sure where they're going to be living, uh, where their kids are going to be going to school, how they're going to make ends meet. They are in a state of generally emotional turmoil. Um, and so when they come in, 
they aren't thinking, oh gosh, everything that I share might come back to haunt me. They're really just wanting to get safe and figure out a plan to move forward in their lives. We want to uh, ensure that what they share in those first moments of crisis will remain confidential because these victims have that expectation of privacy. They come in to a location which is secret in their community. They can't even tell anyone if they're staying in shelter where they're living. Um, so they, they think, well, everything that I'm sharing should be protected here. Um, but the reality is we have had situations in our state where entire files have been subpoenaed um, from a domestic violence program. Um, and we've also had situations where advocates have been subpoenaed so to try to get them to come into court and repeat what victims uh, have said. I should note, although I'm here on behalf of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence, I'm authorized to say that the Georgia Network to End Sexual Assault also supports this bill, which is the statewide coalition of rape crisis centers. Um, they've actually uh, indicated that the rape crisis centers have seen a great number of subpoenas in criminal cases, in rape cases, where um, defense counsel wants to see whether she might have revealed something that would be um, helpful to their case um, in, the, in the, the um, prosecution of that rape. So we are um, we're not only asking you to protect this information to um, make these shelters and centers, truly safe havens. But we're also asking you to provide this protection to protect our funding. All of our federal and state funding requirements mandate that this information be kept confidential. Um, so each time we, a program gets a subpoena um, or a third party request for production of documents, they are in the uncomfortable position of having to fight that subpoena or potentially comply with it and then lose their funding, which would shut them down. Um, so in order to protect that funding and in order to protect these, these um, havens of safety, we believe this, um, this legislation is necessary. Um, I don't know how many of y'all heard the Chief Justice's remarks um, last week in her state of the state. We all did. You all did. <laughs> <We were> all <laughs> Wonderful. Did. You were all ears. All the lawyers were there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, she commented about one of the ways that Georgia has distinguished itself, unfortunately not in a good way. We have been moving up in the rankings these last few years in terms of the number of women killed. Um, we, in 2009, we were uh, 15th in the country. In 2010, we moved on up to uh, 10th, and this year we are number sixth. So we have the sixth highest homicide rate of men who kill women. The vast majority of those cases are domestic violence homicides. We also have a fatality review uh, project in Georgia where we look at cases in which a, a domestic violence fatality occurred. And we try and figure out what went wrong, what policy changes do we need to make so that we can prevent future deaths. We've got a lot of data as a result about domestic violence fatalities and actually brought y'all copies of our most recent report um, for your consideration. But one of the things that we learned in the fatality review project is that uh, less than a quarter of all victims who were killed had contact with a domestic violence shelter in the five years prior to their death. So what this tells us is that these are folks who were obviously in grave danger. They ultimately lo lost their lives. They weren't getting these services. So anything we can do to promote access to these services, we believe will save lives. Can Thank you address for me, Ms. Senator, one of the things that had a question in my mind, I look at the, uh, the definitions and uh, when we def define a family violence shelter, we specifically exclude any governmental agency for that. Uh, what is the basis behind that? I don't know if there's any reason for a governmental agency to be the, the source of having a shelter or not, but uh, tell me what the reason for that, one of you could. I believe the, the reason for that, Mr. Chairman, is that um, as a governmental entity, uh, they operate under different rules and would be considered an arm of the prosecution and therefore uh, they, it would be subject to different rules in terms of disclosure. If I could, Mr. Chairman, I mean, realistically this is about when a victim would have an expectation of privacy and um, an advocate that could fit in this category that works for my office there, there shouldn't be any expectation of privacy. We're still there to provide services and I, to I'm thinking get about them the Department of Family and Children's Welfare. For instance, if that agency had a place for 
and they do have say places for homeless people, but this is also as a arm of that <clears throat> a shelter for women who may be contending they're being abused. And they there was a conversation with the person who serves as a part time counselor about what went on. Uh, I just I don't know if there's a otherwise I understand if your your agencies are having something involved in it, but I'm looking more of the welfare side well, of it. On the welfare side I would say I'm not sure if we still necessarily have an expectation of privacy. Uh, given the fact that they're there seeking some type of government service. I, I, I hear you and, and, and I'm trying to figure out a way to, to accommodate that. I just I don't know if it happens. But Somebody but maybe knows <coughs> here today that when you're there <coughs> government services, I'm not so sure if you necessarily have the same expectation of privacy that you would a private uh, I don't think lay people sit down with the thought of mind I've got I've got an expectation of privacy or not. If, <laughs> but if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not aware of um, any program that DFACS operates that exists to serve primarily mm -hmm. victims of family violence, mm -hmm. and that's how we've defined that, is that has mm -hmm. to be your primary purpose to serve victims of family violence. This language was really intended to exclude the victim witness advocates that work for prosecutors' offices. Certainly. Um, Certainly. Um, um, sort, of, sort, of, just sort of tie it all together, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we'll, as explained by Ms. Senator, we have alarmingly rising numbers in the state regarding family violence, and we're trying to find different avenues to, to deal with that, both on the prosecution side and the protection of the victim side. Uh, in regards to Section 2 of the bill dealing with the victim aspect, I want the committee to remember that unlike m many other crimes, uh, the, the person's danger does not end when the violence against them ends. In other words, a, a, a mugging in a park uh, sort of situation. Uh, for that person who's a victim of family violence, every time they go home, uh, they, they, there is this danger out there. And so uh, we, need to, we need to take that into account in terms of trying to provide that person with certain uh, levels of comfort to, to sort of draw them out uh, perhaps from the home and, and get them to a place where, where they they can find safety either for themselves or for their children. Very good. I, I'm pleased to see the bill before us <coughs> for for a different reason too, and that is back when we were doing the evidence code, mm -hmm. the rewrite of it, uh, we very specifically, right, Mr. Fortner, <laughs> said these are things we were not going to address because we felt a separate bill would be the appropriate way for that to be argued and debated and, and determined, whether this is the right change of policies. We were not looking to make major movement of policy, but uh, the rewrite served other purposes. So this is what we wanted to see happen. <coughs> let, let the bill come forward and let the parties all hopefully work together and find a solution. And we worked very hard to find, uh, find common ground where we could and where we can't necessarily find common ground, at least accept the wisdom of those who, who have certain questions. Um, my friends, many of my friends within the criminal defense bar might not like certain parts of this bill, but uh, but I do thank them for their input because uh, some of sure. their suggestions have been incorporated here and have made it a better bill, as have the members of the subcommittee that worked very hard through two hearings to make it a much better bill, and I do thank them as well. Well, thank all of you for the efforts you put into it. Any questions of the committee for the presenter or his two guests? I think you've covered it well then. We have some others who'd like to address the committee. <coughs> now I get to my right list. And first is uh, Stephanie Woodward. Woodard, excuse me. Stephanie Woodard of Hall County. Solicitor General of Hall County. Excuse me. That's quite right. All right. How are you doing today? I am very well. Thank you. And Glad thank to have you, you with us. Allowing me to speak to you briefly. If I learned anything today about um, corporations uh, issues, <laughs> it's to be brief. <laughs> so I am. <laughs> and don't be dry. <laughs> I am candidly here to ask you to give me a greater burden, and that is that the weight of domestic violence prosecution should be on the prosecutor's shoulders. The policy behind espousal privilege was absolutely brilliant, and that's that, that the woman should have the choice, the victim should have the choice. But the reality and the way these uh, cases play out, with the length of time that it takes for cases to get to court, for what unfolds in the life and separating of marriages <coughs> and lives, are that the weight weighs on the victim. 
I had the privilege of training under Ralph Bowden in DeKalb County in the solicitor's office there in the early 90s. Mm. I had no idea what a visionary he was when he told me we had a no-drop policy, and he taught me to tell victims, go home, <coughs> tell him you got on your knees and begged me to dismiss this case, and I wouldn't do it. Put that target, put that concern, put that problem on my shoulders, and you be safe. And before Crawford, I had all of the tools I needed and rarely tried the hard cases because there was no shield for perpetrators to hide behind. I spent seven years in private practice, and I can tell you that in my defense days, I never had to tell a batterer about a spousal privilege. He told me, and he told me that she wouldn't testify. When I took office in, t in December of 2008, we had a 45% dismissal rate for domestic violence, a rate that I haven't seen since well before I got a law degree because of this privilege, because of this situation. I know that hurt people hurt people, and my goal is not to break up families. My goal is not to just incarcerate and not ask questions. Actually, I'm from Hall County. We believe in treatment. Y'all might have heard about that. Um, I'm asking you to put the weight of responsibility in these decisions back with me to hold batterers accountable. In the package that you'll see, the Gwinnett County case was a Hall County family with two dismissals mm -hmm. that killed during a custody exchange in Gwinnett. I had three cases this week that were dewopped where she invoked, two of which were the second time we've tried to prosecute. I'm up to the challenge if you'll give it to me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Woodward. You do an outstanding job. We're glad to have you. Next we have is uh, Sandra Michaels and Jack Martin with the Georgia Association of Defense Lawyers. Mr. Martin is a frequent uh, guest of ours. Always pleased to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad to be here. Ms. Michaels is covering another committee right now, so All right. I'm going to speak for the association. And uh, I'll, I'll begin by, by thanking uh, Representative Lindsay for helping and working with us on some of the things we've already done on this bill. Uh, I will, I think I cannot not say this, however, uh, before I talk about some details I think would improve the bill. Uh, the marital privilege is a time-honored privilege, and there's two elements to it, and sometimes we confuse them. One of them is the privilege that each spouse has not to testify against the other spouse. And that's based on the notion that we believe marriage is, sanct is, is a sacred thing and the state should not inter interject itself and that a state should not force one spouse to testify in a criminal case against another spouse or in any case. The other is the marital confidence privilege and sometimes we lose sight of that one. And that this bill covers both those privileges and the confidence privilege is equally important, and that is the privilege that anything you share with your spouse in a confidential setting can never be reported to the public so that spouses can be honest with each other. And that is an important value. The state has no business in knowing what spouses say to each other in confidence. That's an important uh, value. We, we talk a lot about uh, the importance of marriage and these two things protect marriage, and we should not lightly do away with them. The concern we have, and I'll go directly to the bill right now, and we've, we've circulated a memo with some of our concerns already. Um, the, first of all, by the way, uh, the marital privilege is both common law in Georgia, but it was also made part of the, of the evidence code, and the federal court uh, you don't have a specific marital privilege provision in the evidence code. We do now have, or will have as of January of next year, a specific privilege in the code, which is at 501, um, 245011. It's the very first privilege that's announced in the code. And 245-503 has the marital privilege with regards, that's the confidence privilege, and the other is marital privilege with regard to um, testifying against a spouse. Uh, the current law, which we, we enacted in the evidence code, has this first section, which is at line 20 of the bill. Uh, it's just been cleaned up a little bit. 
the husband or wife is charged with a crime against the person of a child under 18, and that's been current law, Georgia law, for some time. Uh, and it does have, however, a little di additional language that we're leaving out, and I, I just want to point that out. But such husband or wife shall be compelled to give evidence only on the specific act which the, for which the accused is charged. That means that if a child, and we understand this, if a child has been injured, uh, that the husband or the wife cannot be, uh, can, cannot hide behind the privilege not to give testimony to protect that child. But this limited, especially the confidence privilege. Remember, we're talking about the confidence privilege as well, not just the compellable privilege, is limited to the specific act charged. The new privilege that we're creating, the husband or wife is charged with a crime against his or her spouse. I don't see why we shouldn't add similar language there. Now, I, I spoke with Mr. Safos about that and others, and I understand that what the concern there is that is the, uh, that the uh, admissible in these types of cases is what's called uh, uh, previous disturbances between uh, what's, what's the phrase? Prior difficulties. Prior difficulties. That's the word I was looking for. Prior difficulties. And um, so uh, because that's often element of, of uh, admissible evidence in those proceedings. Uh, and I suggested, well, if we're going, if that's really the concern, not opening up the privilege as to anything that had been shared between the, uh, the spouses throughout there. And there's an expectation when you talk to your spouse that that's not going to come out in court against you some years later, that we limit this to say, and this is what we passed out a memo to everybody, but such husband or wife shall be compelled to give evidence only on the specific act for which the accused is charged and any relevant prior difficulties between the husband and wife. That would cover the prior difficulties uh, uh, concern, uh, but would tighten the privilege so that we don't leak into areas which is not contemplated about uh, what's the real issue here. I believe a similar language should be used with regards to property damage. Um, I have to admit, in my practice, I've uh, often uh, received a fancy sport car as a fee on occasion, and I always try to sell them. And when, usually when I sell them, uh, they'll say, well, this appears to have been scratched here and uh, by somebody keying the car. And the uh, people I often went to would say, well, they're always scratched. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, what we're talking about is sometimes very minor issues between husband and wife uh, that we were taking away the privilege, not only the privilege against testifying, but the privilege against um, uh, comp uh, the protecting confidences. It does, you know, there's a famous principle of law that hard cases make bad law. Uh, I want to keep, I, I know, understand that this, this bill has uh, substantial support and I understand the reason why it has that support, but my effort here with you is to try to tighten it both on those two elements that we limit the language both in two and three to those evidence which is only related to the specific act, just as we limit it with regards to the language with regards to children, including the prior difficulties language as well. Um, and the number four, uh, the alleged crime occurred prior to lawful marriage. I, I think that comes from a, a Sopranos episode, um, and I, I understand where that's coming from. And, uh, it shouldn't have a phony marriage just to create the privilege. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. I mean, guys, let's, re let's face what we're talking about here, and what may happen in these cases is that spouses may be put in jail because they refuse to testify. Uh, and that's one of the consequences of this. Uh, and we're taking the decision as to whether or not the family should be kept together, the, the relationship should be kept together, whether or not there's hope for the relationship away from the spouse, often the wife, and giving it to the prosecutor. Even the well-intentioned prosecutor, let's face facts, that's what we're doing here. Um, with regards to the ability to prosecute these cases, I just want, in passing, I understand the problem that Crawford created. Crawford said that any statement that's made to a police officer is testimonial and is a violation of your confrontation clause for that to come in without a witness actually testifying. But there are, continue to be devices uh, for which these can be prosecuted. The most important one is 2488032, which is part of the new evidence code, excited utterances. The police officer comes to the scene, 
the, the wife has just been uh, assaulted, and she, in the excited utterance in this circumstance, gives that information, that's admissible whether or not she's available or not. Um, so, so that's one way that you can get around that. Now, I understand it's not exactly the same thing as the police officer sitting down and taking a, a, an in-depth statement, but the excited utterance is a mechanism to prosecute these cases that cannot be ignored. Let me turn, so I wholeheartedly ask you to give strong consideration to tightening two and three uh, if we're going to go forward with this bill. Let me talk about the other privilege. This is a new privilege we're creating for people who run shelters or other similar um, safe places for people. Um, uh, what we're recognizing here and what, uh, what uh, Representative Lindsay and others who worked on this case have tried to work with me on is to, to preserve the right of a defendant in that situation to have access to evidence that may be uh, he, to which the defendant has constitutional right to present because it's exculpatory um, <coughs> in defense. Um, and again, I am suggesting that we tighten the language a little bit. I will say one thing just in passing. The unintended consequence of this, I think Miss Pretty was her name. She, I, I remembered her name exactly because it was such an interesting name, who ran a shelter in Athens. She said that this problem is in divorce cases. This isn't a problem in criminal cases. She had never had a subpoena in a criminal case. People in divorce cases have used this where there's discovery. So that what happens is they, they subpoena the file on, uh, as discovery and try to look in the file long before the trial. In a criminal case, that would never happen. What would have to happen in a criminal case, since there's no right to discovery from a third party in a criminal case, you would have to subpoena the file to the trial, the actual trial. And then at that time, the judge, uh, the, the, the agency could um, uh, create a, uh, a hearing, ask for a hearing, or move to quash, and then there could be a hearing as to admissibility. Um, but this is creating a whole procedure. I, I made a sort of a joke. I don't know if it's a good joke, but it, it's, it's a joke about this. It's a little bit like the, the, for criminal defense lawyers, you know, that, that if you go up to a, a, one of those uh, swinging bridges and it says, do not jump on the bridge, you never thought about jumping on the bridge until you saw that sign. This is going to be, and actually we already had a, a seminar last weekend. I'm telling people now in the future, what you should do in any case like this is invoke this procedure to get to the file prior to trial to see if there's anything in there that's exculpatory. So the unintended consequence of this, quite frankly, in criminal cases is to create a procedure that, was no, that wasn't there before. Um, but the defendant has the right to get to this information, and let me call your attention to uh, page 3, line 81, if I may. In a criminal proceeding, it says that the judge can make a determination of whether or not it will be disclosed to defense. Any evidence sought is, if, if, if the evidence sought is material and relevant to the issue of guilt, degree of guilt, or sentencing, for the offense charged or lesser included in offense. I suggested that we make, to make clear that that would include impeaching evidence. In other words, uh, if, a, if a person goes to the shelter and gives an entirely different account of the event than what she's currently testifying to, which would be a prior inconsistent statement which is admissible under the evidence code and long admissible in, under Georgia law, that we include in there, and that I was trying to be as specific as possible, and the language we suggested was including relevant impeaching evidence as provided by code sections 246 607, 246-611, 246-613, all of which deal with prior inconsistent statements and how that has to be, you have to give you have to confront the witness with it, and there's, a, there's an established, long established procedure in Georgia and under the new evidence code. So that it is clear that, you, that it doesn't have to be necessarily go directly to guilt, but would also go to impeaching evidence. Number B, the evidence is not sought solely for the purpose of impeachment of character. Um, with all due respect, that language is a little sloppy. I think what the evidence code means is you can impeach somebody with character evidence under code section 246608, 
which is you can impeach somebody with their uh, reputation or, or an opinion as to their lack of truthfulness. Um, and I suggested to make to tighten this up that we say except as may be admissible under Code Section 246608. Um, I, I was asking, do you have something you put in writing, you said? Yeah, I, I, <coughs> I don't have it in my me, file. Um, she said she had circulated <coughs> it with everybody. I don't know if everybody got it. I, I have. Does everybody have a copy of this memorandum? Do you? Yeah, Martin, in your you files? I just think it would be wise to, uh, <coughs> wasn't the folder, but we can, if you've got enough copies or we can make copies if committee uh, members want these. Anybody else need a copy? Thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. Thank you. I, I, I assumed, that, I, I thought that had gotten into the materials. I know Mr. Lindsay, Representative Lindsay had gotten it and others. Um, the, the, the final thought I had was with regards to the section 86, and I actually have two, no, excuse me, the section at line 86 on page 3. And Again, with all due respect, I think it's, I don't know if you're getting at what you're intending. It's, I understand what the purpose of that section is to say, listen, it, if it's substantially if outweighed by unfair prejudice, a confusion, it's misleading, it's cumulative, which is all current law 24-403. Well, I say current law, all going into effect with the evidence code goes into effect. Um, and... <coughs> We had suggested to actually more model it after 24403 um, by let me see exactly what I said. Thank you. Oh, yeah. um, the probative value of the information testimony is substantially outweighed by the negative impact of the disclosure on the victim, the agent, the delivery and accessibility of services, mm -hmm. the danger of confusion or misleading of issues or by consideration of undue delay, waste of time, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. If you read as it reads now, it says the negative effect of the disclosure of the evidence on the victim. Now, it doesn't talk about the, the effect on the agency or the deliverer or the, uh, uh, what do we call them, the, uh, the, yeah, it's called the agent in the statute. Um, but it, it says the negative effect is outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. Unfair prejudice to who? Unfair prejudice to the defendant, unfair prejudice to the victim, but then it, it, is, is that, that's not the way 403 is written. Um, so I, I think you're got, not getting that what you want. I think maybe one way to, to get to it is to say the disclosure take out the negative effect of, just say the disclosure of the evidence on the victim is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. But I don't think that really gets you there. I, I believe the language I suggested in subsection D really gets to what you're trying to get at is that the probative value of this evidence, what, what value it is to the defendant, probative value of the evidence is outweighed, substantially outweighed, which is using the language of 403, by the impact on, on the victim. In other words, this may be probative, this may be relevant to guilt innocence, but it's outweighed by the impact on the victim, the agency, and, and so forth. Um, it seems to me that the language that's currently in subsection D may be backwards, but maybe I'm just not reading it right. Maybe I'm just n not figuring it out. Uh, and I was really trying to be helpful in that regard. If we're going to do a 403 type test, I think my language makes more sense and will avoid further difficulties in trying to interpret this new statute down the road. Um, each of those are my thoughts about trying, quite frankly, uh, as I want to say up front that GACDL has concerns about this whole movement about the, reducing the marital privilege and the confidence privilege. But if we go and go that way, uh, we are suggesting urgently that the committee give consideration to some of the, some if not all, of the technical uh, amendments or revisions uh, that we've suggested in our memorandum. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Martin. And we do have a question, I believe, Mr. Lindsay. He waved. 
questions of other members of the committee. <clears throat> I think that covers it for thank you. your comments. I really appreciate you being here. And thank you for your memorandum, too. Um, next we have is uh, Wendell Phillips from the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta. Really, I'll be so oh. brief, I could probably just uh, stand. Well, happy to have you with us, Mr. Phillips. Thank you Always very much, pleasure. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I do appreciate this opportunity to just say a word or two uh, about the bill and uh, really to express um, from the Public Policy Advocacy Partnership of Congregations, which is what we now call our Public Policy Ministry of the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta, to express our gratitude to Representative Lindsay uh, for the bill. Uh, it's a much needed uh, bill, I think, in our day and time. It's, all, it's been pointed out well that, that it's much needed. Uh, domestic violence is one of the uh, crying issues of our day, and uh, this bill, I think, really uh, will help us in that, uh, in that fight against, uh, against the, uh, the expansion and the, the continuance of, of that part of our, of our life that we're, we're very sad about and very embarrassed about. Um, I, uh, I also appreciate Jack Martin's comments. I always learn something when, uh, when, when Jack speaks. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, that great minds being what they are, that if there are some tweaks that need to be made to uh, House Bill 711 and, uh, and that sort of thing, I think that, uh, that Jack's comments probably could be very helpful in that and probably have already been considered. Um, that's really all I wanted to say was to express our support for the bill. Um, and Always happy to see you, Mr. Phillips. Well, thank you for the opportunity, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, very do much. We, do you want to have any questions, Mr. Phillips? If we do, okay. I'm not through them, though. Okay. There are a couple of more. And I, and I hope I want to talk with uh, you. You were on the subcommittee. Were these considered at the time of the subcommittee? These are new. Okay. All right. <coughs> we're going to. Bring you in in shackles, <laughs> so, we, so, we hold, so we can hold you here. <coughs> We're going to have a discussion about your memorandum in a, a few minutes, but I want to finish up. I do have my good friend, Mr. Fortner, Brian Fortner, from the uh, the still solicitor general of Douglas County. Mr. Chairman, unless there's any questions you have about related to the evidence code, some of that analysis, well, I'll wave. I know I'm going to have some questions myself regarding, you've heard the comments uh, from Mr. Martin, and I, I don't know if you've had a chance to see this to, to address it, and if you haven't, it may be something that needs to be addressed. I don't know. Mr. Martin, has this been reviewed with anyone as far as the subcommittee members or the uh, prosecuting attorney counsel? We, we have. You know, Chairman, they, they were kind enough to give us this memo beforehand, and we did look at them, and, and like I said, and, and Mr. Spejos could, could probably help address some of these as well. Okay. Perhaps while... Well, well, if, hopefully, if you can remain with us, we'd like to maybe do that. And, that's what I, and I wanted to yes, remain as well. To make sure we that's what I mean. Throw. Yeah. Let uh, you go Mr. ahead. Mr. Chairman, just very, very briefly, and then I'll yield sure. to Mr. Spahas and we'll Mr. Lindsay. through our speaker's list. Uh, I'm Brian Fortner. I'm the solicitor from Douglas County currently. A couple of things that I want you to understand. First of all, there was this talk about this notion that this is a time-honored tradition. I would submit that this is a time-honored tradition for defendants. Where this came from, where spousal privilege came from, was two medieval canons uh, of common law. One was that a defendant had such an interest in a case that a defendant couldn't even be recognized to testify. That was true in Georgia jurisprudence in the olden days, the real, real olden days. The second part of that was that a woman was not considered to have her own separate existence. She was considered to be property of that man. So since he wasn't competent to testify, she was not either. That's where the whole process began, and we started developing these privileges about these types of communication. Uh, Ms. Centerfit said that we're one of six states. The, we're ranked sixth in female homicides. It's ironic that we're one of six states that do not have an exception to the spousal privilege. But one of the things I wanted to point out was there was this notion that by there being an exception to the privilege, we get into all of this unrelevant 
evidence. We could explore anything they've discussed in their marriages or that's happened in their marriages that's not relevant to the case. And the chairman knows that's not tr true because we passed 401 and 403 that deal specifically Rose. with what relevant evidence comes into a case. It's very specific language that can be ruled on by any judge. And if it doesn't uh, shed some light on those charges, it's not going to come in. We're not going to be talking about communications that have nothing to do with the case at hand. So I wanted to point that out. In addition, there was this notion that <coughs> under uh, the new evidence code, there were these list of hearsay exceptions that would allow us possibly to get into this evidence, one of them being the excited utterance. Well, in the Crawford case, they were looking at hearsay exceptions, and they said the hearsay exceptions do not matter. A state can pass as many hearsay <coughs> exceptions as you want to, but you have to look at the confrontation clause. That is what's at issue in that case. So the analysis is not, is it an excited utterance? The analysis is, was it said toward an hour of testimony? Was it testimonial in nature? So even if it's an excited utterance, you have to look at the situation of a case and we have to go to court to determine whether or not the statement was testimonial in nature. Is it somebody screaming, help, he's stabbing me, he's cutting me, he's beating me, something said while it's happening, an excited utterance like that? Or does a victim, uh, when encountering a police officer, say, he just stabbed me and he ran, go get him, he's over there. We go into a very in-depth analysis in those types of cases. <coughs> So it's not simple enough to say that there's an exception. In common law, there were only two exceptions. One exception was a dying declaration under the Crawford analysis, and the other exception was forfeiture by wrongdoing, which th the state of Georgia has, has not recognized. It will be in our new evidence code, but those are the only exceptions. And forfeiture by wrongdoing means <coughs> that you did something to a person to specifically make them unavailable to testify. So those were the only exceptions. So I just wanted to clear that up uh, for the committee. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I could. Otherwise, I'd yield to Mr. Spahas and Representative Lindsay. Well, thank you for being with us today. And thank you. are there any questions? I don't believe there are any. Oh, you do have one. Excuse me. Yep. Yes, sir, Mr. Weldon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fortson, um, can you give me, uh, uh, can you just tell me what uh, uh, you've you've come out on, on, on behalf of this bill? Can you? Just give me some some guidance on how many cases you see where uh, somebody uses the this type of procedure or or the temporary protective order as a as an offensive rather than a defensive situation. And if you've ever seen that in your practice or not, or how many times that's occurred, I can't tell you how many times. I can tell you that I have seen that. My office has a a very strict policy that we will not allow the criminal law to be used to play any type of strategy in a civil arena. You know, if you want a case prosecuted, it gets prosecuted on its merits. So that's been our opinion. I can tell you that with the spousal privilege, we've been prepared to call a jury at 9 o'clock and had someone get married at 8.30 that morning in our courthouse. I have that case number here. <laughs> um, and it wasn't the most serious case in the world, but I would submit every story of abuse has its beginning. I mean, so I've encountered that problem more often than I've encountered this problem of, well, so-and-so wants somebody prosecuted because they're in a custody battle or something like that. But it does happen. But uh, I refuse to play those games. And I think any prosecutor who does, well, they need to be accountable to the voters. That's how I feel about it. Good. How many times that happened? I couldn't tell you. I can tell you that compared to the number of times I'm unable to prosecute a case because of the spousal privilege, pales in comparison. It has happened, but it's not a problem that I see on a regular basis. The inability to prosecute cases because of the spousal privilege I see basically every day. So, and so you don't have any other evidence other than the spouse testifying against the other spouse, and that's basically your whole case, and uh, you can't uh, move forward because of that. A lot of times that's my entire case because what we've seen about these domestic violence relationships, they're oftentimes so controlling there's not a lot of other people involved. These, these victims are not allowed to ha have a lot of other friends. They've been separated from their family. So most of the time, in a lot of our cases, it's the victim's word against the defendant's word. And even though the victim gave an in-depth statement since Crawford's come down, we can't get into it anymore. Occasionally, we may be able to find a neighbor who heard something or something like that. But most of our cases, without that victim, we can't do anything. So it's just one person's word against another person's word. It's two people involved, the plaintiff and the victim, and the victim's word against the plaintiff's or the defendant's word. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there could be in a lot of cases there are children, like there are children involved, 
you know, but w what are you going to get from a five-year-old that saw mommy beat up daddy or something like that? I mean, I don't want to say that every one of these cases only involves two people, but a lot of times getting to what I have to prove in my trial in regards to a charges of battery, simple battery, family violence battery, a lot of times it's the victim's statement. That's my evidence. Um, perhaps I may have an officer who saw some swelling on an eye, but if the officer can't establish that that victim was the only, or the defendant was the only person in the house that could have done that, then I can't meet the burden in my case. It would be on a reasonable doubt. I mean, it's, that's just the fact that we face. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? If not, Thank we're you, always Chairman. pleased to see you, Mr. Ford. I think that, oh, we do have one more. Joan Pretty. Is Miss Pretty here? <coughs> How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you so much, glad to have you. Representative Willard, other members of the committee. I'm, I'm glad to be back. Um, I am the shelter lady from Athens, uh, the director of Project SAFE. Uh, I was also a principal author and editor of the sixth edition Georgia Domestic Violence Bench Book. I worked very hard last year on the chapter on confidentiality for domestic violence shelters, and I am chomping at the bit to have to rewrite that whole thing for next year. <laughs> if this legislation gets passed. When I was here on Tuesday before the subcommittee, I talked about the obligation that we have, um, both because of uh, federal funding and a, a moral obligation for our clients. I won't repeat myself here, but if anyone has questions about that, I would be happy to answer them. I, I talked about the need for confidentiality of our records and compared it to when I was practicing law and relied on the attorney-client privilege in order to encourage my clients uh, full disclosure and therefore improve my ability to represent them. And I, I compared it to that last week and explained how we need uh, victims of domestic violence to feel comfortable and confident that their secrets will be kept. And if there are any questions about that, I would be happy to, to answer them. And last week I talked also about how our, our current system isn't working very well for us to be able to meet that obligation and that need. And I described uh, the times that um, we had been uh, subpoenaed or requested to produce documents, um, yes, all in, in civil cases, um, all grand fishing expeditions asking for the entire file and uh, sometimes even asking for observed behavior. And I went through the process that I've had to go, to, um, go through to try to to stall and prevent from turning over those documents uh, in an effort not to uh, reveal those, those client confidences. And again, I am uh, happy to answer questions about that if anyone has them. But wh what I thought I would um, say today really is, is how I got into this, just, just very briefly. When I was practicing law before I recovered, uh, I represented indigent inmates in the state prison system, and I was asked by my director to look into clemency petitions for victims of domestic violence who were uh, in prison for killing or harming their abusers. And so I um, looked very thoroughly to identify people, and I, I wound up representing 78 um, people in prison who were convicted of killing or harming those abusers. They were, they were all women. Out of those 78 cases, only one had ever contacted a hotline or a shelter for domestic violence, but they had all experienced uh, what is to this day um, some of the most horrifying um, aspects of abuse that I have ever encountered. And that has been my guiding force uh, for the last 13 years at the helm of Project SAFE is the um, memory of working with those, those 78 women. And what we tell people over and over and over again because each of those women told somebody. They told their neighbor, their friend, their pastor, the teacher at their kid's school, their coworker, somebody knew and they got bad advice. And we tell people over and over again, you don't have to be an expert. All you have to do is tell them there's a hotline. Tell them there is a domestic violence center that they can go to. Encourage them to go there and to talk to whomever answers the phone about what is going on. That is the lifeline. That is what will keep them safe from harm. Anything that you do that further qualifies this qualified privilege weakens that. 
We need people to come to us. We need people to reach out to us. We save lives. And so be very careful when you're working with Mr. Martin and tweaking the language on this bill that you don't further qualify the qualified privilege that we're asking for in this legislation. Thank, Thank you. you. Let me ask you a question, uh, Ms. Brady. How many safe homes, safe places are there? There are shelters? 46, I believe, 46 certified domestic violence shelters in the state of Georgia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And are they all generally supported by... Uh, Private organizations? <coughs> They're all 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. um, they all receive substantial um, federal and uh, some state uh, funding mm -hmm. as well as private donations. We all get funding um, through HHS, Health and Human Services, through the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act. That is one of the um, uh, grants that requires that we have re procedures in place to ensure con confidentiality. I believe we all, or almost all of us, get funding through VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, and the Department of Justice is another um, grantor that requires those uh, provisions for confidentiality. Very good. Thank you. None of us are run by DFACs, by the way, and I'm not okay. aware of any shelter affiliated with, um, with the welfare program, just Very to good. answer that question. Mr. Welch? <coughs> yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pretty, good to see you again. The um, question I have, and you may not be able to answer the question, um, maybe you or Ms. Centerfoot would be able to do that. In Outside of the civil arena, <laughs> how often are we seeing um, a request for records relevant to rape cases? Oh, that is outside of my purview since I deal with domestic violence. Please. All right. Any further questions? Well, we're pleased to have you with us today, Ms. Pretty. All right, <coughs> Appreciate thank you. your testimony. <coughs> Is there anyone else who we have not called upon who would like to address the committee on House Bill 711? If not, we'll close off any further public comments. The bill is now in the breast of the committee. <coughs> the chair will entertain a motion on the bill. We have a motion to pass. Is there a second? It is seconded. And do we have discussion on the uh, bill at this point in time among members? I want to ask about the memorandum. If I'll ask you first, Mr. Lindsay, if you will address the, the issues raised in the memorandum. Uh, and I'm, I'm I guess let me say in preface to this, I'm, I, I, I'm fine with addressing it. If we're looking at some changes here that we're not certain about what the potential impact may be regarding the, uh, the uh, effect upon the bill itself or other areas of the law, then I may ask for a, a motion to table for the time being to, to entertain that need. Uh, I think Ms. Martin, I respect very much, and he does have a, some points here that uh, I think need to be addressed. The question is, are we best able to do it in committee with the extent of it? So that's my first comment about it. Mr. Lindsay, let you get your if I may, Mr. Chairman, which mic we, do you we, have we, there? We, we have looked at several of these already. If I could ha ask Mr. Uh, Spejos to assist me with, with the, the Be happy to. We'll recognize and, him as and, and I think perhaps sure. we would be ready to move on. Uh, regarding uh, regarding going through Mr. Um, Martin's memorandum, uh, if you would address first off the first one. I, I would. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Section 2 at line 23 yeah. and 24 for the committee's reference. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> quite frankly, and as Mr. Fortner had recently said, we've, we've got a clear clear guidance from the current evidence code or the, the soon to come into effect evidence code as to what is relevant and what is material. None of this is changing that. I submit to you that the policy question is, are we or are we not going to recognize a privilege when the victim is the spouse? Mm -hmm. And by narrowing it, we create more loopholes for us not to be able to prosecute those cases when we start talking about 
threats when we start talking about prior difficulties was one of the issues but threats that that either correspond with the injuries or came earlier they may be subtle they may be control issues about how the victim um, is under the control of the spouse how the children are under control of the spouse how I, the I agree finance. I think so, we're dealing with relevancy yes sir Th that's either matter, going to be admissible or that not. would be either the courts <clears throat> finding it to be relevant or not relevant yeah. and upon that upon that finding the Court says move on. Yeah, okay. and and for that reason we we would oppose uh, the first. All right. Suggestion. Let's talk about the second one, which is lines 80, 80 and eighty one. Yes, sir. One of the premises of this law, and again, keep in mind that we 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 gathered this from some of the other states that had done this, including North Carolina. But one of the main provisions in eighty three is that evidence is not sought solely for the purposes of impeaching character. In other words. We believe that the evidence should be admissible if it is material to something other than just the character of the declarant. So by doing what uh, has been suggested at lines 80 and 81, it undermines the concept in 83. If the evidence is to come in, it needs to come in for something material, not just impeachment. So that would be... Again, ask this question. We have language in the code that deals with the issue of impeachment, which would be prior inconsistent statements, correct? Yes, sir. Well, I, and so I believe that would be separate. I, my point is, and I, I agree with Ms. Martin, I think your your point's well taken, but I think we do address it by, not in language here, we just, we're just recognizing under 81, the evidence sought is material and relevant to the issue of guilt, okay? degree of guilt, or sentencing. Now, if there, if there are inconsistent statements, I think a defense attorney certainly has latitude and ability to bring that in as a basis of saying the judge she has said this other statement written statement or spoken word to someone else <coughs> that is inconsistent with the testimony now, now go ahead Thank you. That's a good point. So we'll, we're addressing that point now on section 2B at line 82. Um, I think it's line 83, is it not? Yeah, this was earlier. Okay. I'm sorry. Except as may be admissible under code section 246608. All right. So you're saying to have that added at the end of section B. The evidence is not sought solely for the purpose of impeachment of character, and then I accept as may be admissible under Code Section 246608. That part. You just said that limits it to a particular type of evidence regarding trustworthiness, not anything else that she's a bad wife. <coughs> I mean, the Code Section limits it itself. Yes, there comes uh, you know, to begin so, the role. So for a specific limiting question, yeah. that's all that's allowed. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. once again, we're getting back to, to an attempt to, to, to weaken it. I mean, the way we have it right now with it is certainly material relevant to the factual issues in the case. Th these sort of things would be something that would be weighed by the court uh, in terms of whether or not uh, the sort of evidence that Mr. Morton is speaking of could, could be relevant or not. I, I think the statements we have in the, in the law as is is, is sufficient. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, We're pretty yeah. open right now. The problem is, as <coughs> he said, the evidence is not sought solely for the purpose of impeachment of character. I understand that, but somebody might read that, a judge might read that as limiting what is otherwise admissible under 608. I think we are. And again, my point is just why not That's make it clear so that there's no the doubt statute of what we're character talking about. Character truthfulness. That's not a prior consistent well, statute. The problem is 608 basically deals with character and truthfulness. That's right. So that's exactly so basically what you're trying to do is bring it back in what we just take took out. No, the code allows 
there's a limited exception to code for evidence regarding character, which is character for truthfulness. And it's, it's used all the time, both sides, truthfulness and untruthfulness. It goes both ways. And um, that's very limited. There's, there's plenty of federal law on it. And this would say we're not, is it the intent of the committee to take away that code section in this particular circumstance, which would be relevant evidence that a defendant would otherwise be able to present? I, I, I don't. I didn't think that was the intent. I thought the intent was to allow the defendant to have whatever would be relevant on the code. Um, and this sure. has the danger of keeping something out. I'm not, not sure on this one. I'm not sure on this one. I, I'm not sure. If I could, Mr. Chairman, I do believe that it was the intent of the original legislation to limit this evidence. If all it was good, all the evidence would accomplish is attacking the character for truthfulness then that in and of itself was part of what was being protected. Now, a prior inconsistent statement is not something that's trying to be protected here. So both the second and third suggestion undermines the provision that the evidence is not sought solely for the purposes of impeaching character. I mean, that is clearly an intent, has been the stated intent all along. And we're using that to consider you piercing a privilege. Them, you just can't impeach them through, through, through these records. That's right, through those records. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're taking away the opportunity to impeach evidence that's available to impeach on those records. I, on the I'm record. just telling you, but I, I'm not, it's, it's a policy I, decision, and I'm I, just saying. It's a clarity, I, I it's a clarity question. I understand, but, but that's all <coughs> it is, is, is to, within the, the confines of these records, not have these records be used for that purpose. Well, the evidence can be by records or I assume by oral testimony too. <laughs> yes. We're not just dealing with records. And we talk about what are the exceptions the court finds as being a way of compelling. Yes. All right. As far as the, the last one is concerned. <laughs> this is blind 8589. I, I, do, I do agree that, that, that part of this I, I would agree to. Uh, which is the first part, uh, which is the probative value of the information or testimony is substantially outweighed by the negative impact by the, the yeah. negative what's the term we use? Outweighed by the negative the impact the negative of disclosure. Effect, the negative effect. The negative effect, okay. Because we already have that defined. The negative effect of the disclosure on the victim, period. Uh, we would agree that, that that probably would be cleaner language. The remaining uh, information contained in here is already a factor to be considered by the court under 24-4-4. That's fine. Okay. That, that covers, you're right, 403 is already in the law. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I still have some concerns about the one at 2B. <coughs> it's line 83. Let's try to read this thing again. Read if you got it for me. Yes, ma'am. Please, Ms. Travis. Uh, what, uh, I'm a little confused at what, what's trying to go on, but what one of the things that's confusing for me is you use this for purposes of impeachment of character. And if we really are saying we really don't we really don't want anything that's coming in under twenty four six six oh eight, rather than saying impeachment of character, why don't we say the evidence is sought solely for the purpose of um, well, these are the exceptions that they're putting out, not a, not <coughs> a way of admission. I mean, that's the question. That's, that's part of the problem I'm having with it, language-wise. <coughs> we'll acknowledge from the beginning that the stated purpose of that language was to prevent you calling a, uh, a, a person that they confided in trying to receive services at a shelter to now simply impeach character, not prior and consistent statements, but character for truthfulness in and of itself. So there was an intentional trying to qualify that. We don't want to keep a prior inconsistent <coughs> statement from the state or from the defense, but we do recognizing the, the how important the, these confidences are to the declarant, we do believe that we ought not be calling a witness just to attack the truthfulness uh, or character. And I'm, I'm concerned the way it's worded within this issue of the exception. And for that reason, I am going to entertain a motion to table while we, uh, between now and the next meeting, get that resolved. 
I just think we better serve to be sure we're all understanding how the exceptions to apply. Uh, so moved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion to table. Second. And it's been seconded. That overrides the prior motion is due passed. The chair will take a vote on the motion to table and it'll be tabled until a specific time the next meeting of this committee. All in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed like sign. Thank you.